according now. All right, on the motion, this house refers a world in which post-colonial African states had prioritized achieving economic and land reparations uh, over enshrining civil and political rights. I would like to welcome the first speaker of the proposition to open this debate. Thank you. When it comes to POIs, I'll just put them in the chat, please. Everybody's ready? I'm sorry. After the end of apartheid in 1994, it was thought that the Beers, a Dutch mining company that has done horrendous human rights violations in all of Africa, would be called to account for its crimes. But this didn't happen, and the Beers survived untouched because of its stranglehold on the economy. It controlled 85% of companies of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, and the new government could simply not risk an economic collapse. This imbalance of power in terms of money and land is keeping Africa under the strong grip of neocolonialism and keeps democracy as only a pretty word on a paper. That's why redistribution should have been a number one priority for post-colonial Africa. Three substances which will show you why that's the case. First, on economic ability, second, on bargaining power on an international level, and third, and our second, about reconciliation. But before that, let's use your points of frame. First of all, this debate takes place in times of post colonial Africa, so 60s and 70s of the last century. In opposition's world, that's when African states had priorities ensuring civil and political rights, such as rights to vote or rights to protest. And the mechanisms for this were usually either work of civil society groups or protests as such. So think protests that were a part of the anti apartheid movement in South Africa. Now, opposition may have gotten these rights to some extent. However, most of these rights will exist solely in paper. Take, for instance, Angola's constitution that stands for freedom of protest and speech, but then their government kill pro kills protesters, just like it did last year when people protested and demand political alternatives, alternatives to the 45-year rule of the government governing party. Now, that being said, what is the alternative uh, are economic and land reparations. So these are things such as land redistribution, quotas and import and exports. So these are quotas and things like food and raw materials, exports from exports from the colonized nations to their ex-colonized uh, ex -colonized, uh, power. And lastly, these are things such as unconditional cash transfer to the victims of the colonial rule. Now, why is our alternative likely to be successful? Two reasons. Firstly, it's because new national governments need to legitimize themselves because and the popularity and success of ruling parties is based on a narrative taken back from the colonizers. Hence, if there is a strong preference for redistribution of capital, the government is highly incentivized to go through with it. The second reason why it's likely to be successful is simply because the West has an incentive to have good relations with newly founded countries so they can still have access to Africa's raw materials and labors, but also so they, they don't side with the USSR with whom the West is currently at that time with in the Cold War with. And lastly, it's likely to assume that on proposition, and the political situation would have first stayed the same, so meaning undemocratic governments, for instance, who are in power and are unlikely to lose the next election. However, this is the trade off we're willing to make because, in the short term, we enable better economic stability of the people in Africa, but in the long run as well, we can assure them all with political rights. Why that's the case, I'll be moving on to my first substantive. First, on the economic stability. So, to contextualize, there are two things. Firstly, as a consequence of colonization, when Black people were often banished from their land, the land is today highly unequally redistributed among races. So, this looks like Nam Namibia where white people own 70% of land. Second thing you have to notice is that many of these countries' key industries are agriculture and mining resources, meaning economical branches directly dependent on land ownership. That being said, what are the two consequences of people not receiving land in the status and money in the status quo? First, on the individual level, it's simply impossible to access social mobility because these people have no land, meaning they cannot grow their food, they cannot sell it, they cannot rent their land, they cannot exploit the other resources the land has to offer. But moreover, there is no social mobility because there is no money for further or higher education for these people, meaning these people are generally stuck in one exploitative job, which is being a farmer on another man's land. That is the sole reason that 46 out of 54 African countries are still in the bottom half of this global social mobility index list. Second consequence then on not receiving land or money is simply on a country level of economic uncertainty and poverty. This is so because the whole economy is structured in a way that money eventually goes to the hands of the rich or white elite because they're the only one big employer, only one big landowner. What is the comparative we bring you? We tell you if, if we had focused first on a power redistribution of both land and money, none of these things would happen to the same extent. What would happen instead would be redistribution of land, which would enable people to have capital to achieve social mobility or with cash transfer programs people could afford themselves with land or education. And as a result of both of these things, 
And the impact here would be economic stability because people would have bigger purchasing power, because locals would have more control over the production of goods and their prices. And social mobility overall would be provided a long-term possibility for the development of secondary and tertiary sector as people have more capital for education. Now to preempt opposition that is going to tell you all about how important political rights are, we agree, but we believe that access to land and money is the logical prerequisite for achieving political rights because otherwise these rights exist solely on paper for two reasons. First, it's some leverage and lobbying. We believe that since the rich elite have the most capital, they can threaten the firing workforce and control prices of key products. Hence, people have no real recourse in a country with such big economic inequality. But moreover, secondly, people may have right on opposition. However, they're less likely and less able to practice them if they're working multiple jobs to survive and don't have capital for education. So to conclude, if we weigh on metric of logical order, on pop position, we give people economic stability, people have their own land and education, which nobody can take away from them or use it to manipulate them, and only then people should and can have access to successful, successful protests and gain their rights. That being said, I'll move on to my second substantive before there are there any POIs. Thomas Sankara, the liberation leader of Burkina Faso, was ousted in a coup initiated by France after trying to implement economic reparations. Okay, I can name you a few examples where there was also coups and civil wars when people tried to gain some rights. We believe that on both sides of the house, there will be some certain extent to people being uh, dissatisfied. We believe that this is quite not a debate. Second substantive on bargaining power on an international level. So during co colonialism, colonized nations modeled African economies after their own needs. So this looked like Britain forcing Ghana to massively produce their cocoa so they can export it to Britain for their beloved Cadbury chocolate factory. And that's the reason why 60% of Ghana's exports was solely basic, basically cocoa. And generally, the West prevented product diversification by forcing Africa to specialize in producing only a few products. So this prevented local econo economic growth and made African economies completely dependent on the West for any other products. Now, in opposition, after colonialism, Africa prioritized ensuring political rights. This means that all economic plans were characterized by the governments of newly independent nations hastily taking loans from the West. This allowed the West to impose their own conditions and all structural, structural adjustment programs, which is today known as neocolonialism. This program include uh, removing any obstacle to trade, privatization, devaluing their current currency, etc. This is detrimental because this enables Western exploitation. First, with conditioned loans, so Africa stays dependent on the West. So this looks like, for instance, Angola, which in order to get a new loan, the IMF conditioned it to sell 195 of their own businesses, including their old company and their diamond firm. But moreover, this looks like with flooding after African markets with cheap products and ruining the local economies, which well, for instance looks like Europe that has successfully ruined South Africa, South Africa's poultry market by selling meat for 30% cheaper than the price of local farmers. What is the comparative that we bring you then? We tell that on opposite on proposition, Africa could develop their own economy because people would have their own land to farm and they can sell their crops, lessening their dependence on West and giving them more bargaining power. Moreover, to the quotas on import, they would have more power over the food prices and they wouldn't allow West market flooding. So what is the overall impact of this substantive? Firstly, it's more bargaining power in international institutions because they aren't as dependent on foreign commodities, nor Western corporations creating jobs for them anymore, so they can bargain more in terms of setting their own tariffs and trade conditions. But moreover, there would be significant product diversification as people are able to make money off of their own land or with the help of cash transfers, more local businesses would be popping up that the IMF could no longer condition to shut down and would grow with the purchasing power these businesses would grow. So all in all, what I want you to remember from my speech, we firstly have to to give these people land and some money. We have to give them economic stability. We can have to give them some bargaining power so neocolonialism doesn't happen. And that's when we can actually have maybe some rights, but after, uh, so, so proud to uh, stand on side proposition. All right, I thank the speaker for that speech. Uh, can I check if the panel is ready? If you are, just give a thumbs up. All right, uh, to open this debate for the opposition, can we have the first speaker of the opposition? Here, here. Um, okay, just to a reminder, my pronouns are she, her, and I would like pure eyes in chat. I will count myself down in three, two, one.
The only way for side proposition to win this debate is if they prove to us how economic reparations are actually going to solve the economic harm of colonialism that they spend majority of their time characterizing. We don't think that they effectively prove this and they ignore the harsh reality that Africans face when the wrong policy is prioritized. Our case is going to prove the multiple ways in which their economic reparations don't fix this economic harm. Our stance on side opposition is twofold. One, we would have preferred states devoting their time, money, and political will into enshrining political rights. This looks like a strong judiciary with specific and accurate law. It looks like increasing democratic access through enough polling stations and ensuring political parties campaign freely. Secondly, what is the economic policy on our side going to look like? No reparations programs, sure, but still using the the mechanisms that African countries use to uplift people, like welfare, like pumping money into education. The difference is that it is slower, less invasive, and focuses on giving Africans access to an already existing economic system, even if that system is colonial. But what this means then is that a lot of props benefits aren't actually mutually exclusive. We're not neglecting the economy in its entirety, it's reparations that we think they didn't justify. We're willing to trade off the immediate economic upliftment of people because we think prioritizing political rights creates a framework for long-term permanent and equitable economic development to happen. Before I get on to my arguments, two points of rebuttal we just quickly need to deal with. Firstly, they say that there are failures to maintain political rights today in African countries, and they give us a couple of examples. First response, we don't think this is entirely true. We think there are lots of African countries like South Africa and Botswana and Namibia that have functioning democracies where their people have a lot more political freedoms than they had under, under colonialism. But secondly, we think we're allowed to not be satisfied with how the political rights were maintained, but we think the reason that they weren't maintained was because of bad governance. This is something worse on opposition side with the implementation of economic freedoms, as there are no ways to hold governments accountable for their economic failures. We think on our side, even on our worst case, where states backslide into less political freedom, because the people have the institutionalized right to that freedom, they are able to fight for it. I don't have to tell you more about the Arab Spring, etc. but we think there's evidence of this happening. Second thing I need to rebut is this idea of land reparations, because they give us a lot of analysis on purchasing power and capital, but they don't actually explain to us how land reparations work. Let's explain to you how it works. We think there are permanent colonial structures that prevent land reparations from happening equitably. This looks like the scrap for Africa, leading to arbitrary divisions of land, which makes land claims incredibly complicated. But secondly, we think that one person owning land 50 years ago is now five people. The amount of people having a claim to that land has grown. How do you fix that on your side? We think they ignore the reality that they are defending Zimbabwe, where land reparations were not only unequitable, but quite literally destructive. Understanding why we've disproven their case on an assertive case on economic development. Let's give you two substantives, firstly on why economic reparations won't lead to development. This directly classes with their analysis and also deals with the idea of how the international community is going to react. First argument here, we think you're going to get a major backlash from colonial powers. The premise of this argument is to say that the vested interest of colonial powers is to keep their economic stronghold of Africa and creates, which creates an incentive to retaliate against economic reparations. Why is this true? A, the original premise of colonialism was European powers needing to fulfill their internal demand through extracting resources from Africa. This led to the creation of a mercantile system, meaning cash crops were prioritized like German policies in East Africa that forced local farmers to produce cotton for the sole purpose of exploiting it. But B, it looks like the geographic importance of developing nations for trade and security, like the Suez Canal in Egypt. We think that they agree with this, but then they say that they allow for the maintenance of that power under their side, and we get more backlash like because of political changes. We think this is completely untrue. We think that economic reparations actively disrupts the process of accessing that mineral wealth and creates a strong incentive for backlash. But moreover, we think the only time that the West has acted in this way politically is in the instance that political rights had led to the infringement of their economic power. This looks like the British still allowing traditional systems of government at the, at the instance where they get economic benefits. This directly disproves their idea that, oh, 
if you change political structures, they're going to have the same reaction. We think that their reaction is entirely based on an economic harm. What does this backlash look like on proposition side? We think it looks like imposing sanctions, invading again, staging coup d'etats, and staging assassinations. There are many examples of when this happened, but the clearest is with Patrice Lumumba in Congo, who prioritized economic reparations, which threatened the mineral exports out of the DRC. He was assassinated by the CIA and the Belgian government, which created a power vacuum and long-term economic and political instability in the DRC. Our, our POI spoke to this as well. Secondly, on governance, we think that the context of the leaders that exist is the same on both sides. The majority of struggle leaders drew on the concept of freedom, and enshrining it. They studied politics, they wrote manifestos about it. I can talk about Kwame Nkrumah, Patrice Lumumba and Thomas Sankara for hours. What does this mean for the implementation of policy on both sides of the house? On our side, we have leaders that are better adapted to making political decisions as opposed to making economic decisions, both in experience and incentives. This concludes that regardless of what they deem actually more important between economics or politics, by virtue of these leaders being more equipped to enshrine political rights, the way up becomes bad economic policy on prop side versus better political freedoms on our side, something we're always going to prefer. A clear example of this is Kwame Nkrumah fixing the price of cocoa, which significantly harmed the farmers within Ghana, but he is still considered a hero when it comes to writing about the political freedoms of Africans. The impact is we disprove the premise of their entire case, that economic reparations would have led to the economic development of African countries, they needed to do far more. Before I tell you about the practical manifestation of the political rights they decide to ignore, I'll take a POI if there is one. Why do you believe that there won't be ethnic conflicts in, in cases where you get just, when you prioritize only one ethnic majority and give them all rights on your side of the house? Quite simply, we think on your side, at the point we have the colonial legacy that entrenched economic harm that harms the ethnic minority, you have no way to change that. Your reparations are going to benefit the majority. On our side, when we enshrine the rights like equality, the rights to vote for change, that is when ethnic minorities get a say in the changing of institutionalized systems that harm them. Second argument on the practical manifestation of political rights. This directly clashes with their comparative on how, oh, you can't access a, um, anything unless you have economic empowerment. Why is accountability so important? The context here is that African citizens were seen as property of the state. This classification means that the mass exploitation of Africans was con con constitutionally justified and even more so for those ethnic minorities. This meant for harsher punishment and more unfair conditions within the workplace like the arbitrary arrests in Nigeria and the exploitation of labor quite literally everywhere in Africa. This speaks to the crucial importance of civil and political liberties in relation to economics that propagates. What do we change? On our side, the state is obligated to enshrine and protect political rights in a nuanced manner. But secondly, individuals role within a democracy is recognized. Their role as holders of personhood is recognized, which means we have stronger in, and we have stronger institutions that protect that. The impact here is that we prevent the possibility of exploitation, even in the instance of economic development. We think we no longer allow companies to have the same exploitative practices. We think Uhuru means freedom. The caged bird sings for freedom. All right, I thank the speaker for that speech. Can I check if the panel is ready? All right, to continue this debate for the proposition, can we have the second speaker of the proposition? Here, here. Okay, am I audible and visible to everyone? Yep, yes, you are. Uh, okay, so just to remind you, my preferred pronouns are she, her, and I'll take my POYs verbally, so just unmute yourself and I will take the POY or not. And with that said, um, okay, I can start my speech in three, two, one. If you look at it historically, Europe got the rights the moment in which what was distributed, the middle class grew and they could fight for their rights and even more important, put them to practice. And this is something that we want to see happen in, Afri in post-colonial Africa. And this is something that happens in proposition. So what we believe on this side is that we really should 
prioritize economic reconciliation because this is the uh, this is the logical uh, pre, uh, condition for any kind of rights to actually develop in these kind of countries. What side proposition? What side opposition needs to show you is the likelihood of democratic uprising. The coup thing they ask us in the POY is completely symmetric because to some extent people will be unhappy on both sides, so it is symmetric. But if we weigh surviving because you have food and uh, some and the importance of abstract rights that they talk about, we we can clear, clearly see that having food and surviving is much more important. But furthermore, they give us examples in which we tell you, okay, so for example, Guyana, this is a democracy on paper, but we still had coups last year. And this is something we can see that their side is not proving uh, rights and their side is not proving all the things that they want you to believe. Furthermore, in my speech, you will hear some rebuttals and then I'll be going on to my third argument about reconciliation. So firstly, something that they tell you is that we need to show economic stability. First of all, we tell you this is our whole first argument that they didn't really respond. We tell you on a personal level, this is really important to a person to have uh, some uh, some land because in that case, even if that person can have like a coop of chickens, that means enough for him because that means that at the end of the day, that person will have food on, the on their table and that person will survive. On a whole country level, we can see that these uh, that once we can like uh, up, uplift their economy from the inside, then Africa can actually become stable, and then Africa doesn't have to rely on uh, on uh, the. Uh, on the bargaining uh, power that uh, the West has on them. And this is something they also have, haven't responded to in our second argument. We tell you that African economies were tailored to benefit the colonizing power. And what they produced and what quantities and all of this was actually like conditioned from the West. Ghana, for example, Lara gave you, had to produce only cocoa powder because this is something that English wanted. So after decolonization, Africa was dependent on taking loans from the West and this allowed West to create their own demands and thus put Africa in a lesser position in bargaining, ergo neocolonism, and even further by this flooding African uh, market with their cheaper products such as poultry in South Africa. And on top, Africa can develop their own economy from within. Farmers can sell crops, invest, or even themselves bargain with the West. And the impact of this is the bargaining power that they never responded to, and then uh, and product diversification, which we believe is very important. But on the extension, we tell you what happens inside opposition. Africa has to keep taking money from the West. Then what happens is West can put any kind of sanctions that they want because they because Africa will have to accept it because reality check democracy can develop in two years, something that side opposition decided to not talk about. And then what happens is economy stagnates. We remove all of the companies that could have been created in Africa. And this is when you get absolutely no benefits on side opposition, something they never rebuttaled. But furthermore, we tell you on holding government accountable. First of all, we believe that institutional rights, something they talk about, means nothing if it's only on paper. What's uh, what they trade off? Let's take a look at the weighing on their economy. On their side, their economic uh, alternate uh, alternatives are harmed by the West and companies coming to Africa. They stagnate all economic progress. Side off trades off short-term financial benefits and allow foreign companies to come and destroy local markets. And on uh, and on intensity, Africa is being conditioned by the West economic aid on side opposition. On their on their side, foreign companies price gouge and destroy local markets. Those companies then bargain power away from the locals. And on their side, African markets are not independent and are being price gouged even more. And this is when you get even less economic stability. And by that logic prerequisite, you gain even less, um, even less, uh, even less price. But on the relationship between West and Africa, we tell you that this is happening during the Cold War, meaning 50s and 60s. This means that Africa will have to side either with Russia or with the West. This gives the West intention, uh, intention and incentive to actually be nice to Africa and give them like all the necess necess necessary things that they want. But furthermore, if they want to prove that West is so malicious, then what's happening on side on opposition, you give them even more time to actually become even more malicious and even more like destroy African markets as well as African rights. So the ethnic, ethnic conflict thing they also talk about, we tell you that in our POY, we tell you that, okay, ethnic conflict can also happen on your side because by that logic, like if, if some ethnicity gains more rights and the other doesn't, this is when you get uh, this ethnic conflict. But furthermore, we tell you that you derive your political rights from your land and property. If you have 
have the money, you can influence politics. If you don't have the money, you don't have to like work every single day of the week, then you can like engage yourself in politics. Even if you do have political civil rights inside of, they're more symbolic on paper because people still can't engage in politics. And But even if we side with their metric and civil and political rights, we win long term because this is a logic prerequisite to have some land in order to have some rights. With that being said, I'll take a POY why before I move on to my argument. The country in Africa, most infamous for its land reparations, has faced economic and political destruction. Account for Zimbabwe. Okay, I can name you a thousand examples where economic reconciliation was much better, such as Rwanda, that is in the like, um, top countries in the world of social mobility. I don't understand your point. It's very, it's very extreme. Anyways, going on to my argument. So how was the population affected at the time of colonization? Those, uh, those in power were mainly Western European white men had all the power over the land. This looks like them coming to a family and forcing them out. And even if those families survive, they, uh, the original owners would be forced to work manual labor, live in small spaces with no hygiene and small amounts of food. They were thrown out to forced to live day by day. So what was the situation then in post-colonial Africa? They still didn't get their land back. They still have angst and hatred towards the leading power. And the pure fact that their grandparents have land that now they can't have because of the political power means they, stay, they still feel robbed and abandoned by anyone who could help them. And the impact of this is on a psychological level. This means they lose motivation to try and fight for their rights, land, or even good living standards, putting them in the same situation as it was when they lived in the colonial country had all the power. And this creates an overall sentiment in which people have little to no power or motivation to actively engage in politics which could be their way out. This unfair land distribution means that certain groups do have land while others don't. Those groups then want to act in some way to get their land back. And they do this through violent attacks because they don't see any other way of doing it. And this is something they also talked about. And this is how ethnic conflict is created and how we further the already existing tension. This is exactly why, for example, in Namibia, there are violent attacks and like coups and murder rampages on people owning farms by those who, whose answers to the land was taken. So how do we reconcile? Through fair land distribution, we fix the practical as well as the principal problem and, in, and injustice is done to the population. Firstly, through land distribution, we would give them the land that is rightful owners, which are the original owners who were thrown out. Secondly, direct money transfers that served as a stepping stone for them to get back on their feet. But thirdly, deal dealerships with, with big companies who own the land and have plantations or factories. On the comparative, when you give them political and civil rights, they don't have the private property. The fact that they have a right serves only as a symbolic gesture that they can't put to practice. They still feel robbed and don't want to engage with the system who robbed them. Furthermore, they don't have the education to do that, but also they don't have the time because at all times they have to work in a factory in order to feed their family. On prop, we focus on economic reconcil reconciliation. We fulfill the principal need for justice, as well as giving them money or land to invest their feed back. This is the way they start to engage in politics and work towards ensuring their rights and thus create equality. And this is why I'm so happy to propose. Thank you. Hi, can Thanks. we just have seconds? Oh, sorry to interrupt. Can we just have 30 seconds to reconnect the speaker to our platform? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah, just let us know when, when you're ready and then we can move on to the next speech. Yeah, in the meantime, can I just check if the panel is ready? Okay, can then we just wait for uh, Team South Africa to reconnect the speaker?
Uh, sorry, South Africa, if you're saying something, uh, you're, you're muted so we can hear you. Okay, hmm. um, we've connected. Thank you so much for your patience. Again, Gadla Homokosi, O2, and also reply. Just a Here, just checking that I'm still visible and audible. Yep, yes, you are. I will begin my speech in three. Uh, sorry, before that, could I just uh, get what your PY preference is again? Sorry. Oh, sorry, um, POI for the whole Team South Africa is in the chat. Thank you. Starting in three, two, one. We introduced a very important metric in O1, which is to say that side proposition needs to prove that they get reparations not only in principle, but in practical. Specifically important because their whole case does hinge on the practical outcomes of their policy. My whole speech is going to be dedicated to firstly deconstructing those practical outcomes, but secondly showing you why opposition gets them 10 times better. Firstly, let's engage with the context that this debate needs us to speak to. The first of which is about the leaders. On both sides, we agree we have the same level of symmetric leaders. This is important then because they have the same level of malicious intentions. So even if they prioritize economic reparations, what does malicious manifest as in economic reparations? It looks like individuals not being able to get the money, not being able to get the land. It looks like the unequal distribution that they try to fight for so hard on their side not being attained. On our side, here's the comparative introduced in first, is that we have learned behaviors from A, the populace. Secondly, we have a strong judiciary, but thirdly, we have external me mechanisms of accountability that mean we can actively revolt against that and stop that probability and nip that in the bud. Secondly here, there's a bottom line that we need to engage with. And that bottom line is the West is always going to develop from Africa. They have built permanent infrastructure, they've set up permanent mineral resources, and there's a vested interest from Western powers. The truth is the team that wins this debate is the team that shows you that Africa can benefit too, not that the West is gonna leave. Third thing that we need to engage with is their alternative. The alternative is simply not true because we don't think necessarily that the alternative on our side is going to be like complete anarchy and violent revolt because the truth is when political rights were enshrined, people were happy on the outside. Secondly, let's look at majority of their argumentation and what it leads to, because there's no real progression from first to second. Two main ideas that they thrust in their case, unequal distribution, which is going to be fixed by upward social mobility, and secondly, that they do better for the situations of these individuals economically. The strategy of these two arguments is hung, right? Because they say in the first argument that the, the distribution is going to be equal, therefore social mobility is going to manifest and a whole lot of other things. I'd also like to introduce a secondary principle consideration here is to say, even if the acquisition of the land was unjust, which is to say it was forcefully taken, it was colonially taken, and it was not uh, like compensated for that land. The maintenance cost put into that land over the 50 years, the labor put into that land have exponentially increased the value of that land. So our proposition needs to defend is taking an additional harm, incurring an, a harm that didn't exist before, i.e. when that land was acquired, when you want to reparate that land. This is to say they have a higher burden to show us why A, MNC is unlikely to comply, but B, that, com that compliance is something that is valuable and is something that is principally legitimate. We think they, they can't just run away from the harm. Now that I've engaged with the strategy of the arguments, let me deal with them on like a substantive level. On the first idea of unequal distribution, three levels of responses. The first of which is to say they assume that the land these individuals are going to get is profitable land. We think this is categorically untrue. Majority or majority of the land claims um, in South Africa are estimated to take about 50 years to adequately reparate. The mechanism might first it. But secondly, when we look at Zimbabwe and Tanzania specifically, the land that was given to these 
these individuals is often unoccupied, unarable, and unprofitable land. We think this is the likely like comparative that side proposition needs to engage with, not like this kumbaya under their side. Secondly, they assume a level of skill to maintain this land. This is to say that farming land and owning land is something specifically different, especially when that land is used to export the mineral wealth of the country. So even if they had the skills to farm their land, they are unlikely to have the skills to own that land and therefore profit off that land. This is to say that now the land is used by Western powers and there's a vested interest and they're unlikely to manage that specifically Quickly, when they second speak, that tells you that their educational levels are so low that they're unlikely to engage in like business of this level. Second, the idea of neo-colonialism. Three reasons, three responses to this. Firstly, we think it's unlikely to happen. My first book about this. Secondly, we think they lost majority of their funding at the point at which the USSR collapsed. By the late 1970s, 35 out of 60 countries were aligned with the USSR. We think of UNITA, SWAPO, ANC, throughout Africa. This is important because by the time independence were re was reached, the USSR had already collapsed and the individuals that were gonna fund this land reparations, that were gonna fund these economic reparations were no longer funding them. This then meant that they had to turn to nefarious actors like the IMF, the nefarious actors like the World Trade Organization with a symmetric on both sides. On our side, we control their power. Power. I've done a lot responsibly. What have I done? Firstly, I've shown you why the strategy is misaligned with majority of the context. Secondly, I've shown you why the conclusions that the argument is, uh, proves are unlikely to manifest in the real world. And thirdly, I've shown you why the neocolonialism argument isn't necessarily an argument on its own, but secondly, it's worse on their side. Before I move on to my substantive as to why we're better long-term economically, yes, you are. Can you show us a systemic analysis as to which why the malicious intent of the government doesn't exist in the Senate of the House and why uh, they're likely to give in the, uh, the, uh, the rights and not just give us an assertion that they'll have? Because it's happened all the time, right? We think the malicious intent specifically manifests as governments being power hungry. We regulate that power hungry government by the learned behaviors that the population has, i.e. like unionizing and like, um, mass protests that we've seen in the past. One argument then, better for long-term economic growth. First level is to say we attract economic growth. Investors and business specifically need to know that there's a political stability and rights so that the investment won't be appropriated. Secondly, there's security, which is to say protect private property. And thirdly, accountability, which is to say that you have the ability to go and get legal recourse against any harm um, like that comes on your company. This necessitates a strong court system that are well founded on political representation. This is important specifically when you think about one of the most successful companies throughout history. The Dutch East India Company wasn't successful because of its colonial context. It was largely successful because the Netherlands was pioneering court systems. This then meant that the Dutch East India Company had good business practices, could actively give workers the necessary rights they needed and use that and made those transferable skills. We think on the comparative, they need to defend anti-private action by methods of distribution and have a more anarchic state and tell us where they get their funding because it's not gonna exist. Secondly, we think political freedom specifically encourages free thinking and creativity. We encourage individuality and we encourage dissent and skepticism. This is all essential for innovation and upending the way things are done, especially when it comes to questioning authority. Think about why prisoners are prevented from accessing certain literature because the government doesn't want to, them to think in a certain way. Specifically post-independence, when individuals are no longer censored, they need this access to dissent, something that they only get when you nuance their political rights instead of just giving them blank political rights. We think the ability to unionize, the ability to associate politically is something you're only going to get on our side. The comparative is they teach a culture of obedience and they're unlikely to get accountability in the long term for bad economic policy. The impact is A, business is more willing to invest, which is especially impactful given the skepticism surrounding this country, given that it's new and the conception is still young. But secondly, you get more free thinking, which means you're likely to incentivize innovation with governments that can sustain that innovation. The importance here is that developing nations aim to be developed. One, we say the presence of MNCs brings upskilling and sharing of business practices. Secondly, we think skill transfers to smaller, small to medium enterprises. And thirdly, we think innovation allows governments to find niches and specifically compete internationally. An example is the Serum, of Institute, in, the Serum Institute in India for vaccines. What is going to win the debate? The, the side that frees the bird that cries freedom, the side that sings Uhuru with that bird, side with art.
All right, I thank the speaker for that speech. Uh, can I just check if the panel is ready? All right, to continue this debate for the proposition, can we have the third speaker of the proposition? Here, here. Yes, so my pronouns are she, her, and I'd like my POIs in the chat as well. And just give me a second so I can set my timer and then I'll start the speech. <clears throat> Okay, uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna get started. South Africa tries to debate this, this, uh, this motion with example. They all throw out statistics about Zimbabwe or about South Africa, but they never give us substantial enough analysis on why their model is better, why their model works, and why these statistics are relevant in this debate. And this is why we win a few things in my speech. First of all, three clashes on the feasibility of our model, the intensity and the quantity of people we help. But first, let's uh, just say that I did never rebuttal our third argument, which is about reconciliation, which is about the feeling of empowerment you get when you're giving land back by the people who tortured you for years and years, when you see these people finally getting their due done. Okay, so now let's talk about the feasibility of our model. When you say we have less democratic government, that is true. And we're fine with that, first of all, because in terms of uh, economic stability and accountability, our governments are going to be much more accountable, actually. Why? Because if an authoritarian government does a horrible job at leading a country over and over again, people's dissatisfaction leads to violent pushback or a revolution because that's the only way they can remove this authoritarian government. In an already unstable country, you don't want that to happen. This is why Rwanda, with an authoritarian government, ranks higher than the Netherlands and Switzerland in easiness of doing business and liberty despite being an autocracy. Secondly, governments, uh, democratic governments can scapegoat their failures by saying this is a, the mess the previous government left, we don't have the majority in parliament, etc. Or scapegoat economic failures by saying, well, we gave you voting rights, you have to vote to fix the economy. And people are less likely to react violently because they're being manipulated constantly and believe it's always someone else's vote and it will get better. In that moment, we believe it's more up. Uh, beneficial to actually have a slightly more autocratic government on our side. But oh, okay, let's go on to uh, the incentive of the West to go along with the redistribution of goods or retributions. First of all, uh, when we talk about good relations, we're telling you not everyone became independent in the 90s when the SSR fell apart. Most people, most colonies became independent in the 70s. In that moment, it was really crucial for the West to be in good relations with these economies because of the SSR, because they did not want to side with them. Uh, secondly, uh, note that this incentive isn't contradictory to the West's incentive to have malicious conditions in their loans because they package those conditions as benevolent aid. Secondly, on international pressure, during decolonization in the 70s, liberalization movement happened in the West as well. For example, protests in France against the war in Algeria or protests against the Vietnam War in the 70s. This is the basis for international pressure for the Western states to atone for their atrocities in colonialism. And this is why Germany offered uh, reparations to Namibia self-incentivized. But lastly, when you claim the West is so malicious by, wanting, by waiting so long to become economically independent, you're letting the West have their way for longer. You're giving them more time to exploit you and we're ready to risk some backlash from the west in order to not stay exploited by the west until they decide to become benevolent which is never okay so now that i explained the feasibility of our model on the basis of the type of government we have and on the relationship with the west let's talk about the quantity of people we help people can't participate in your democracy an analysis that was never uh that side opposition never rebuttaled. They have no access to information. 90% of Niger still doesn't have access to internet today. Now imagine how many people had access to campaign information in the 70s, almost none. Secondly, they have no formal education to understand the information they're consuming, even if they can access it. And thirdly, they're enduring full days of hard labor on someone else's land, probably starving and worrying how they'll feed their kids. These people have no time to think about who they're gonna vote for. And more polling stations, which was your only rebuttal on this analysis, can't counter this. All of decisions then are being made by the rich elite who are the only ones who have the access to this democratic process because they have education, money, and time. And even if more people do vote, these rich elites still have a majority of the resources in the state, and they still have disproportionately more power than the average voter, which they can use to lobby. These analyses, analyses were never countered from side opposition. They cannot do that in op three. That is too late. Okay, so despite prioritizing democracy, you're not actually achieving a legitimate democracy because of the functionality of the democratic process relies on participation of majority and representation of majority, neither of which you get. Our side, the redistribution policy is much more likely to trickle down to a larger amount of people because there's no prerequisite for you to get land, unlike participating in democracy. Now, why will, uh, rep and we already explained the incentive for governments to give land because on our side, governments can't scapegoat as easily. This was an incentive analysis at the beginning of my speech. Note that this incentive analysis applies here when you say reparations 
reparations won't be done well. But also, why will reparations be given more equally to ethnic minorities? Because these minorities are also a large percentage of the population in many states. And so obviously, prioritizing the ethnic, not prioritizing or completely ignoring the minority would cause instability. It's in the interest of the state to give these minorities at least some land. Because in Uganda, for example, 77% of people are different ethnic minorities, and only the other 23% are made up of two ethnic majorities. Comparatively, on your side, the government can blame ethnic minorities for their own problems because they could have voted better. And the government defends their discrimination by calling it serving their own constituency, who is the ethnic majority. But lastly, even if ethnic minorities don't get anything, even without them, we're helping a much bigger amount of people because all the poor people from the ethnic majority who don't have representation on your side because they don't have access to the democratic process, have some money, have some land on our side. So on weighing, we help a much greater quantity of people. And that is why the slash goes on our side. But let's talk about the intensity with which you help. When we talk about the problems of the people in the status quo. These problems are urgent. They are starving. They can barely afford their food. Their livelihood is on the edge. To address this to policy, and that's great. But with the way the democratic process works, first you have to have campaigning, then elections, then you have to vote in parliament, then implement the policy if you have the money for it. That takes a very long time. And then at the end of the day, the policy still might not help everyone because your policy is, for example, subsidies for cocoa farmers. Anyone who isn't a cocoa farmer doesn't benefit from it. These policies aren't necessarily a bad thing, but they're not urgent enough. On our side, how do we help? We give people land right away or we give them cash right away. Now, on intensity, private property is basis of fulfilling all your other needs. By buying a sewing machine because you got an active cash transfer, you can start your own business doing for people in your village and finally be able to feed your two kids or send your kids to school because you have some extra money. The land, you, you claim the land is not profitable, but this is an assertion and contradictory to your claims that this land would go, on the other hand, be seized from existing colonial farmers who wouldn't work on unprofitable land, and it's a land to which of which value grows. And that is the characterization we're going to adopt and say this land is profitable. But secondly, we have active cash transfers, which we never uh, engage with. And at the end of the day, you say these farmers don't have skills to make a huge business from the land. They don't need to make a huge business from their land. They're starving. They can't feed their kids. They need a small farm to grow some food so they can save some extra money. That is all they need. And, all, and secondly, land is the only thing that gives you agency and independence. Otherwise, you're completely dependent on government policy, which you can't guarantee will always be successful or fast enough. So on intensity, we win because we're helping these people much more intensely than you are by bringing some policies which may never be implemented well. Before I go on, I will take a POI. Reparations mean nothing in isolation. How are people going to profit off of land without upskilling? We think at best you rely on the long-term project of okay, education, okay. something we claim on our side. We already explained what, we have active cash transfers. We literally don't need people to profit off land as long as they can save money by growing some of their food. You have no analysis in this POI. This is just an assertion with fancy words. I'm sorry. So now let's go on to long-term stability. When we say prioritizing democracy, this means the economy takes a back seat. So most property stays in the hands of the rich white elite and people, they get richer while the rest of the population stays poor and all the profits from the rich right to lead go out of state because they're because these are foreign companies and foreign people so when you talk about any economic growth on your side it does not exist because the property is not in the possession of the people from this country who would bring money back to this country so when we talk about your side decreasing the value of the land our side decreasing the value of land it doesn't matter because that value would never come back to the country where the land is from anyways so in your best case you do nothing to change this but in your worst case you try to have your cake and eat it too but you don't have the capacity to both democratizing and focusing on the economy this is when the West steps in and offers you loans and technical assistance. And if you apply with, it will comply with certain conditions like lowering tariffs, opening up just trade, and you're not focusing your resources and time and economy, so you have no capacity to research the actual effects of these conditions. And that is when your economy becomes exploited by the West. That's when you become even more dependent when, uh, on the West and the victim of neocolonialism. This is what we're preventing by developing local economies, because when locals become independent from Western economies, when they have their own ecosystems within the country, then they also fund their local administrations, which in turn bring them healthcare and education, etc., which then in turn makes people a smarter workforce, which then builds your economy. So on the fact that we uh, affect a greater capacity of people, help a greater capacity of people uh, with bigger intensity and have more long-term economic stability, please vote side proposition. All right, time to speak up for that speech. Uh, checking in the panel is ready. All right, uh, before we move on to the next speech, uh, just a reminder for speakers uh, to please give the person asking the POI the full 15 seconds to make the point. Uh, try not to cut them off before that. Uh, because you did accept a point, you should also listen to the point to its fullest extent. Also cutting off, cutting them off makes it quite hard for the judges to hear the point as well. Okay, to conclude the substantive portion of this debate, can we have the third speaker of the opposition? Here, here.
Okay, um, sorry for the delay. My name is Marcus Fadira. I'll be the O3. My POI preference is in the chat. Um, pronounce your name. I'll begin my speech in three, two, one. Struggle movements were fought hard for with blood, sweat, and tears. The decisions that they make immediately after the victory of independence matter. It is not just a paper that individuals on the other side of this house want to talk about. It is what people dreamt for. It's what people gave their lives for. What am I going to be doing in my speech? Before, I'll do some strat, one strat issue, and then I'll go into three questions that you should judge this debate on. One, does economic reparations lead to economic upliftment? Two, who provides political freedoms? And then three, uh, how will the colonial powers react? So one strat issue. South proposition likes to give a response that we can give a thousand other examples to every example that we give them. Note that we've been very careful about not repeating examples. So we've been closer to that number of 1000 than they have. But the point is, we have to consider examples because this debate is not a theoretical one. It's a one about real countries that has happened in the past, things we can point to. That was important given that they haven't engaged with Zimbabwe to the end of this debate, which is literally what happened and is their model. Okay, first question then, does economic reparations lead to economic upliftment? What did they tell us? They characterized the problem of colonialism, something we never disagreed with. But then they said land will give threat to uh, will give social mobility and it will prevent stuff going to the elite. How do we respond to this? Look, look before we get into the responses to this, let's understand what economic policy can happen on our side. That's to say, they have to support a very specific economic policy. That is economic reparations. On our side, we can do what African states have been doing for decades, social welfare programs. So it looks like upskilling programs. It looks like grants to elderly and unemployed people. These are all things that have prioritized political freedoms. What is the impact of this response? This deals with a large majority of their push on their side to say that a lack of money is the reason why people can't fulfill their most basic and immediate needs. They needed to prove why land was the only way to achieve that wealth, regardless of the status quo where individuals are doing it nonetheless. The difference then becomes that perhaps on our side, perhaps we're a bit more long-term and a bit slower, but that way up is important in order to not antagonize the rest of the world and to make sure that the way we do it isn't going to be unfair to the most vulnerable. But furthermore, what do we say? We said it wasn't going to work on their side for four reasons. One, the scramble of Africa meant that the division of countries and the artificial borders meant that land is now no longer what it used to be and you can't reparate properly. Secondly, we said claims are impossible to settle given how much time has passed. Thirdly, we said it's not necessarily always arable land, therefore it can't always be economic. And then fourthly, we said these individuals don't always have the skills to reform that land. Those are convincing reasons never responded to. The second thing we told you was that on IMF loans is likely to be worse on their side. Here's some new responses. Their third speaker tell us that they're going to be super quick. Why is that not true? Three reasons. One is that land requires you to work on it. So you can't literally benefit from that land until the next harvest season. Harvest season. You can't benefit from that land when at the point at which those old land owners out of spite might have burnt down its infrastructure or took everything from it. Second response why it's untrue is that land requires maintenance. So you can give somebody a piece of land to farm. It doesn't necessarily mean they have the resources to work it. Thirdly, Land, in order to benefit from growing crops, we need access to markets to sell those crops too. Colonial infrastructure was bought in, uh, built in such a way that it went directly from the mines to the coast, to the harbor where you can export those minerals. It does not pass any of the arable land in their best case scenario for individuals to benefit off. That means they don't have access to markets. It's not gonna have the super quick benefits that they want. But even if they do, I've already described to you why the most extreme needs can be addressed too on our side. What do we tell you? We told you that given these are struggle heroes, liberators, political freedom fighters, they are best positioned to be, to give those political freedoms. So even in their best case, when they try to implement it, their economic policy is likely to be worse than our political policy. 
But then my second speaker in, uh, went further and said, we're actually better for economics at the point at which we have a fair economic system that attracts foreign investment. That is super important for that lack of capital. I just told you that proposition cap lacks. But secondly, the point of innovative thinking. Note that side proposition did not respond to this at all in their third speech. They had ample opportunity. They chose to ignore it. This is us beating on their own metrics. This is us beating them on their own terms. Before I move on to the second question, I want to re-provide political freedoms better than they do. I'll take a POI. The money for your social welfare programs come at the price of children working on Western cocoa farms because the West is the one who gave you the money and the West gave you certain export conditions you have to meet. Okay, let's realize that the West really don't like child labor. The IMF is a bad actor, but at the very least, they're not enforcing child slaves. That's a very like extreme version, right? We think we can might have a little, uh, like money is symmetric on either side based on how much it requires. Second question, who provides political freedoms? What did they tell us? They tell us that, well, first, before we go into what they told us, let's just acknowledge that all of their analysis on providing political freedoms, or at least the majority of it, depends on them providing economic rights. So given that I've already proved to you why they don't give those economic rights in the previous clash, they don't get those political freedoms. So what did they tell us? They overcome inequality. They don't practice their rights. The middle class is empowered. All of that I've dealt with in the previous clash. But then they told us, well, actually, poor people are quite easy to generalize. They don't have knowledge in order to engage with these systems. They don't have time to engage with these systems. And they don't have money to care about politics. Why is that untrue? One, people out of an independence movement are very politically active because those were the same people engaging in civil disobedience to overthrow that colonial power. Those were the same people training in militias like Nkonto was seized in South Africa in order to overthrow that power. They are very aware of the political situation in their country. But also, this is a novel, life-changing moment. It looks like your first democratic election. People are going to show up. People are going to care. They're going to take one day off of work, especially if we make it a public holiday. But then they told us, you're actually worse for ethnic minorities. Let's listen to the logic of this argument panel. Why, why in most cases, are ethnic minorities abandoned? It's a lack of representation, a lack of political structures to represent them. On their side, your, your land redistribution is not going to go to them. On our side, we give them an accountability mechanism to deal with that. Note that all of our accountability analysis from first has not been directly engaged with to the end of this debate. We're winning on that front. Last question then, how will foreign powers react? They tell us foreign powers will just bend to the wills of African states that they, re where they recently colonized. And understand the logic of that, right? The fact that you were able to colonize them, but now you're beholden to them. They said, one, because they need access to minerals, and two, the Cold War. Note, in their best case, you no longer, these big, these big powers no longer have the incentives, because if your reparations work, you're literally taking away the ownership of these big states, of the harbors, of the mines, of the, of the roads. That's to say, you're literally undermining yourself when you say those things, because you remove the incentives for them not to invade. But we gave you reasons as to when they did. But then thirdly, the methods of the Cold War was never to stand by idly through diplomacy, but was more commonly uh, proxy wars. Uhuru is a word in Swahili that means freedom. And the cage bird sang for freedom. All right, I thank the speaker for that speech. Uh, checking the panel is ready. All right, to conclude this debate for side opposition, can we have the reply speaker of the opposition? Here, here.
Is everyone good? Uh, you're um, audible, but maybe could you speak up a little bit more? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, better? Perfect. Yeah, much better. Starting in three, two, one. Panel, here are three things I hate. Firstly, the IMF. Secondly, neocolonialism. And thirdly, poverty. The truth is, half of these things are likely to exist under both sides. The question becomes, which side deals with a nefarious actor like the West with malicious leaders like Africa's? We think side proposition has presented a largely idealistic case that is rarely withdrawn from the context of the reality. So here's what I'm going to do in my reply. I'm going to ask four questions that help us walk through side proposition's case. The first of which is, can their context really stand together on two levels specifically? They tell us at the top of their framing that this is an incentive from Western governments to continue to align with these um, African nations. But they also tell us that the mechanism through which they want to like uplift the, the African people is through economic and land reparations. The issue, however, is this is some of the most radical socialist communist policy. This is important because their incentive is premised on the idea that the USSR is going to be quelled at the point at which the West continues to engage with Africa. A strange contention. Secondly, the ideas of malicious leaders, because if both sides characterize these leaders as being malicious, and we have seen this militia in manifesting through corruption, what does corruption look like on either side? Corruption under our side looks like count accountability mechanisms through other political parties, through mobilization, through popular protest. On their side, it looks like A, difficult to trace because who knows about economic policy anyway under their characterization. But secondly, it looks like the mother that you're trying to save not being able to get the, tra the cash transfer, which she so direly relies on. We think that characterization is unlikely to be legitimate and is unlikely to serve the individuals they try and serve. Secondly, we need to ask ourselves, is the alternative that they proposed really unique? Because if they tell us that the best thing they get is cash transfers and money in the immediate term, what then is the way up? Because under our side, we're happy to support the existing mechanisms that came after enshrining of political rights. We think welfare is able to serve the same the same benefit of like cash transfers with additional benefits of being able to still invest in your education system to still invest in things like upskilling why is this something they can't do under their side because they're going to need to fund like taking the land from these mncs in their best case this means you funnel money away from other projects. This is then specifically important when we ask ourselves, can reparations really happen in isolation? Because at the point at which they tell us that there's a cost to maintaining land, there's a skill required, but also these individuals don't have the skill. How do they want to equip the population to manage the issues they present there? Thirdly, can the Western institutions really act in a manner that is not nefarious? What did we give you and what, why was it important? Here, I want to bring back my, P, my O1s matter that has yet to be responded to. We told you that there's a vested interest from the, from, like the from the colonists to continue their economic presence within Africa. This is important because any attempt to undo that economic presence is always going to result in a harm. This isn't just a harm on the economic faction of this country, but it's a harm on the political faction, which means in the long term, you're likely to get an instability. That means you can both not do economic reparations, but also not do anything political. We think on their side, they haven't given us something to compare it to. So let's take the best thing they tell us about individuals being able to get upward social mobility. We think this is unlikely to happen given the characterization of the type of land these individuals are going to be getting. Fourth thing we need to ask ourselves, is it really fair to model your case in third? Because majority of the mechanisms that they want to assert to us throughout their speeches comes only in third. They tell us that there's a level of accountability that they get on their side, that the economic reparations is going to have a trickle down effect. But at the same time, they tell us that these individuals are unlikely to participate in the democracy. So how then should you weigh the debate at the end of the day? Firstly, who does better for long-term economic reparations? My, my argument. Secondly, who does better to deal with the nefarious waste? My O1's argument. Who does better for Africa opposition? All right, then let's go for that speech, checking if the panel is ready. 
All right, to conclude this debate for side proposition and the round as a whole, can we have the reply speaker of the proposition? Here, here. Check am I audible? Yep, yes, you are. Great. In this reply, there's going to be weighing. Firstly, on the model of which is more likely, then on the urgency, why do we win? On magnitude and lastly, on the logical order. We so let's start, firstly, let's start with then on the model. We first want to clarify something. We don't believe that opposition had the ability to come here and say, yes, our model simply happened. No analysis as to which, how it happened. No actual context of what, what did it cause, how the victims and everything that uh, they had to go through and no actual reality check as to which that Africa today, yes, it could be a bit better than it was, you know, during colonialism, but it, it definitely isn't the perfect picture that they want to proceed to. That being said, why is then our likelihood, why the unlikelihood, it's unlikely they have the rights that they claim they do have. Firstly, we tell you that their characterization of malicious government doesn't work in their favor. We tell that if we take their characterization of malicious government, we believe that we, if you go past their examples and all of these searches, oh, it just happened and it's just going to happen again. We believe that on their side of the house, this malicious government has the, all of the attempt to simply scapegoat, to say this is exactly what Angola did, for instance, to scapegoat and say, oh, but your constitution simply says that you have the right to protest. Maybe you, uh, you, your constitution simply says that you, may, that you have all of these rights. You do not have the right to, pr to protest again because you already have it on paper, and they have the the incentive to do this because it's so malicious. But we told you that uh, we t we uh, we can also have then on the likelihood. We believe that a malicious government is much more likely to actually cater to us because, first of all, notice, and this was something that was hugely told you in our third, about how also these governments do the reply on, do depend on their economy. So they have an incentive to, for their own malicious uh, ideas, give this to people so they can have some stable economy. But moreover, this malicious government wants to be in good terms with the West, etc. specifically, and the West has an incentive to give them back because it's at the time of the Cold War. But moreover, I want you to recognize something. Never did they tackle the point of active that cash transfer. All of their analysis as was to which, oh, but you know, it's hard to have redistribution because you don't know how profitable some land is and who was it before. We tell you at their best, Fine, you have a huge, just huge amount of our model never being responded to and still stands as something that is just as possible to happen because it was untouched from our first uh, speech. So even if you claim that maybe redistribution is unlikely to happen, if we have active cash transfer, that is still a huge, huge benefit for our side of the house. Then let's move on to the, the point of urgency. We told you that it is un and then we cannot wait until maybe people get their rights, maybe until some of the uh, at the time, or moreover, we cannot wait until maybe some policy becomes implemented that perhaps has an ability to maybe impact their lives if it's uh, specifically targeted to them. We believe that on urgency, these people, because they were, uh, this was a time of after colonialism, so they, it was a centuries and centuries of never having their own economic uh, economic rights or any cash to put in their pockets. We believe that on urgency, they simply have to get it as fast as possible because it is a matter of life and death. Therefore, on our side of the house, because these redistribution happen and because active cash transfers happen, they at least get some money uh, to their pockets. Second of all, when you talk about the magnitude, we tell you, and I like to point this out, they tell you, oh, but poor people do not know how to farm their land. Oh, but yes, they can uh, completely know how to vote on your side of the house, specifically if they uh, didn't have a touch of democracy but for, from ever, from, uh, for the, never, basically. But now they simply know how to, uh, how to do all of these things. If Believe this is simply false, but moreover, we believe we're going to uh, we're going to help you, as our third speaker told you, because they have an incentive to get, give them them land, and even some amount of land, even some amount of money, is still a huge benefit from them. Therefore. From our side of the house, this is going to be accessible to all and not just the rich white elite that has the ability to get educated and maybe to vote for the one party is going to give them benefits or the other one that is also going to work in their benefit because they're the only important uh, voters. And last, I just like to point out, I'm not going to repeat this because there was this was brought out in my first speech on the logical order of the wing. Why is it unlikely that you give economic rights after you get after you have some political rights? This was never once touched about the lobbying, about uh, about the leverage and about how people actually cannot uh, cannot protest continuously for all these reasons so proud to propose all right i thank the speaker for that speech and i thank all six speakers for this debate uh before i 
thank like ask everyone to cross our and shake hands. Can we first show our appreciation to our volunteers, Sarah, for helping us to keep time? Uh, I'd like to ask everyone to use the clapping hand emoji reaction uh, to thank uh, Sarah for keeping time. It's really not easy. And um, we offer our, our, our thanks to you for that. Uh, second of all, I'd like to invite everyone to uh, virtually cross over and shake hands. The way I normally do it is either a clapping hand emoji or a heart emoji, uh, up to you, uh, because you know you're in different places. But nonetheless, uh, you know, in the spirit of debating, thanks for the fun shake hands. Okay, what's going to happen now is that the judges are going to move into a breakout room. Uh, I'm going to say let's move to op prep room five. Uh, sorry, op prep room eight A. So op prep room eight A. We'll go there. We'll discuss for around twenty to thirty ish minutes. We'll come back with the OE and the call, and uh, we'll be happy to give feedback thereafter. All right, thanks everyone. I'm going to pause the recording. Okay, first thing first, uh, let me just say that the panel really enjoyed this debate. Uh, and I will say that personally, as a historian myself, I was actually very, very impressed by the scale of research that both teams did on a admittedly very difficult motion. So I offer, and the panel offers our heartiest congratulations to both teams. This was, for me at least, the best one I've watched so far. And I watched the top room in round eight of the Eastern Division. So I think people should be quite happy with the speaker scores they got this round. Okay, uh, that said, uh, the panel did come into a unanimous decision in favor of a team opposition. So that is Team South Africa. Congratulations and commiserations to Team Croatia. Uh, I'm going to go through the areas of style, content, and strategy, but I'll be very quick on style because it didn't really affect the decision much. Uh, on style, we would note that both teams exuded a level of emotional maturity in discussing these issues. Uh, we will just note two things. Firstly, um, we note that opposition concludes their speech with the same line, uh, which is a good thing to have, but we would say that sometimes it's a little bit um, not natural, like it doesn't quite flow. So we would perhaps encourage you to uh, try to find ways to make it flow a little bit better. We will note that uh, some speakers on proposition was perhaps a little bit faster than our liking, but nevertheless, uh, <coughs> style was not an issue uh, that really affected the call uh, in either way. So moving on to content, which is where this debate took place in, and as well as strategy will be amalgamated in the middle as well. There were two questions that we thought this debate came down to. The first question is the more important question, and the second question is a bit less important in this debate. The first question, which is a big question, is does economic reparation lead to economic development and therefore economic upliftment? We would note that this is the broad direction of the proposition's case and what they needed to prove in order for them to win the debate. Under this broad question, there were three sub-questions, and I'm going to go to each of these sub-questions slowly and also explain how we came to our conclusions in this debate. The first sub-question is, how does this economic reparation thing actually work? And to what extent would it be successful? In that, like, how, like, will you get the land essentially? The proposition begins this debate by suggesting that this is a case where we are taking the land back from the colonizers, we are giving the land to people in these uh, new nascent in these nascent countries, and that they will be able to use this land as as a as a whole. We did think that there was a number of challenges from the opposition that perhaps weren't very well responded to by the proposition. The first challenge that the opposition offers is the question of how are you going to check for the land claims? They suggested that doing things like the scramble for Africa, uh, there were arbitrary borders that were drawn by European colonizers, and these necessarily complicated the extent to which uh, land claims can necessarily be legible. And the conclusion that you would get therefore from that point is that um, lots of people have claims over land. It's unclear how the land claims itself would be adjudicated. The response that we then get from the proposition, from the, uh, sorry, and, and this is bad because the likely situation then is that minorities are not likely to get the land in as much as the claims are disputed. The proposition does give a response to some extent. They suggested that because these countries don't want to form tensions or don't want to cause disruptions, the distribution of the land is likely uh, to be relatively equal. That said, uh, the question of how were these multiple claims adjudicated, we felt was a challenge that wasn't addressed adequately enough by the claim that you can have relative distribution because even if it's relative distribution, it's not clear how you resolve the earlier challenge of people having claims to land. So to that extent, then, the panel generally felt that when it came to the question of how would this work, uh, we were, I guess, to some extent, uh, brought into the case that the opposition provides that there is some doubt as to how exactly would this model operate. But let's assume that the land distribution is successful and we are able to distribute the land properly, which I would note this isn't a very big claim. Uh, it's not a very big issue in, in the round. 
The next question that we need to ask then is, will giving land necessarily result in development and upliftment? Propositions claim in this debate is as such. They suggest firstly, that land means access to things like resources, and means that you have access to things like farms, like chickens and uh, crops and whatnot. This is good because this allows for individuals to work on the land, therefore earning them money, and from there, economic development for the rest of the country. I would note that just from my recap of the argument itself, uh, I think people can really start to see there's a little bit of a logical jump between people individually earning money in farms, leading, and then the connection from that, therefore, to economic development of the nation. So we will note that there's kind of a bit of a logical jump there as is. What do we get from the opposition then? The opposition suggests a couple of things. The first thing that they suggest is to suggest that the reparation process is likely to be slow. I think we hear the example that it took about 50 years, I believe, in South Africa for these claims uh, to be filed. That was the first response they provided. The second response and the one they came back to more often is two things. Firstly, they suggested that the land they're going to get is likely to be bad and, and not arable. And because of and second of all, even if the land was arable, these individuals have no training to use the land and therefore are not able to sufficiently use the land as a result. I think we did get some challenges to this from the proposition. So they suggested that, but the land itself can be useful in other ways as well. But I think the more the challenge that crop comes back to a lot more, however, was this idea that but we have cash transfers as well. And cash transfers can also be useful in fulfilling basic subsistence needs like the access to food, access to things like uh, water and whatnot. But I think at, the, <clears throat> I think at this point, uh, we didn't think that the cash transfers argument was sufficient as a rebuttal for two reasons. I think the first thing to say here is that it's not very clear what this cash transfer would look like. So how would people use it beyond the point of subsistence? But the second point to make here is that uh, even if it is subsistence, it's not development, which is kind of what the proposition was trying to achieve in this debate. So there's again a missing link between how the cash transfers will result in economic development as a result. The last thing that we get then from the, from the opposition is this idea that having land is not sufficient. You need to have access to markets. And it's not clear how the market access is possible because you're going to anger the West uh, in the world of the, of the proposition. I will discuss how you anger the West in the second issue afterwards, but I will note here that markets, according to the opposition, is important because without access to markets, you don't have access to development as a result. So at the conclusion of this issue, what, we, what the panel felt was that the opposition was able to demonstrate that the proposition perhaps will get subsistence pump, they will get some degree of money, but it's not clear how this is equivalent or would likely therefore lead to a fully functioning economy that is economically development, economically developed as a result. So on this question of whether giving land means development, the panel generally felt that the opposition, that the proposition wasn't able to approve the burden that he set out to prove in this debate. The last question under this issue then is the question of does political enfranchisement and political rights lead to economic development, which is the counter mechanism provided by the opposition. Opposition material uh, came out in 01 talking about accountability. It wasn't particularly clear how the accountability mechanism uh, worked well in 01, but we thought that this material was much better expanded and in fact fully expanded in 02. They also talked to us about how in order for you to access things like investments from corporations, you need to have political stability, security, as well as degrees of accountability through things like a strong rule of law and a court system. I think we heard examples of the Dutch BOC and how it succeeded because the Netherlands had court systems. I think the comparison here is that the opposition was able to demonstrate that investments are needed in the long term for fuller development and not just for immediate uh, satisfaction of current needs. Um, the response that we then get then from the proposition is really this claim that investments from the West are exploitative, it's likely to be bad, and therefore that's something that we needed to avoid. But I think what the opposition was able to demonstrate here was that even if the investments were exploitative, there were trickle-down effects that came to the people in a form of things like skills and infrastructure, and more importantly, through things like political accountability, which is the old one's material here, which was impacted in O3, uh, people are less likely to be exploited because their rights are enshrined within the constitution. We will note here, however, that we would have appreciated perhaps more analysis of what the political enfranchisement and the enshrining of these rights would look like. We thought that that particular line was perhaps a little bit missing from the opposition, but nevertheless, we did think that the opposition at this point was able to demonstrate that they were able to provide an alternative means uh, to be able to access development compared to the proposition. So, I, and 
And also the last thing to say here is really that I think the opposition has a suggestion that these leaders are because of the context of the time, they have more capacity to do things like rules of law as opposed to focus on economic development policies. They point to the example of Ghana, talking about how uh, individuals, I think the president in Ghana uh, was able to write really good court systems, but was economically greedy and that resulted in problems for the economy. So at the conclusion of this first issue of does economic reparation lead to economic development, the panel generally felt that the proposition wasn't able to prove the link whereas we felt that the opposition was able to prove the com a, a alternative means by which to achieve economic development, and therefore we felt this issue went to them. The second issue that's a bit more slight here is the question of how would the West react to this policy. The proposition says that the West is likely to be good to uh, African nations because they have resources and because of the Cold War. On resources, the op responds by suggesting that no, because in a world where you have reparation policies, you are taking the resources away from the West, and giving that to the people in the African nations. And this is likely to anger the West and create things like coups, sanctions, et cetera, which are worse. Uh, we will note that uh, perhaps there could have been a little bit more analysis here to explain how exactly the West would react in this way. But nevertheless, we did think that the point was made. We don't think there was a particularly strong response to this coming up from PROP. What we did get from PROP, however, was this idea that, uh, okay, sure, but they will then turn to the USSR and then that becomes an issue. That is a response that stood until O3, who told us that uh, the Cold War was fought not only on diplomacy, but also through things like proxy wars. So I think the conclusion of this uh, issue, therefore, we felt that <clears throat> uh, it was likely that the West uh, would have a negative reaction. So even if we didn't buy the USS, so even if I ignored the USSR response, we did think that the um, coups and sanctions argument did have some staying effect in this debate and was it adequately responded to uh, by the by the proposition. The last thing I would say in this way is the question of the logical framing. So I think the, the props framing that it makes that it only makes sense for you to have access, so it only makes sense for you to have political rights after you have economic uh, capital in the first place. We will note a couple of things on that framing. The first is that this is a contingent framing on prop proving that they get the development. Uh, we weren't clear how they got the development and therefore we didn't think this framing uh, stood particularly well in this debate. Uh, comparatively, um, we also did think that some of the reasons given by the prop, that is, for example, that uh, people are too busy working to fuse, uh, then to, to participate in the political process, uh, were things that were engaged with by the opposition who suggested that this was a transformative event uh, that people uh, would want to engage with in that sense. But nevertheless, we did think that that framing, although strategic, uh, was not one that was won by the proposition for the reasons that I've explained. So that's the reasoning for the decision. Uh, I do want to just end by saying that both teams genuinely did a very good job uh, I understand that this is, you know, like it may be disappointing to some, but I, I just want to say that debating really is a journey uh, and that I think both of teams will go quite far in, in debating in life as well. Thank you. And then I'll stop the recording now.